Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Talitha L. LaFloria, who's a historian and associate professor of African American Studies at the Carter G. Woodson Institute, University of Virginia. She is the author of the award-winning Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South, published by the University of North Carolina Press. And, and let me just go through all of this so folks understand what we mean by award-winning. This would be the 2015 Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Book Prize, given by the Association of Black Women Historians. The 2016 Darlene Clark Hine Award from the Organization of American Historians. The 2015 Berkshire Conference Women Historians Book Prize. The 2016 Philip Taft Labor History Award, given by Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. The 2016 Malcolm Bell Jr. and Muriel Barrow Bell Award from the Georgia Historical Society. And finally, the Ida B. Wells Tribute Award from the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Did I forget anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, you did not. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Talitha. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me. We're in a really interesting moment. Um, when I think about your book, New books by Brittany Cooper, mm -hmm. Treva Lindsay, um, Professor Dunbar. I mean, it's just amazing mm -hmm. books. We seem to be in a moment where we're looking at the flowering, yeah. really, of black women historians. Um, and not just telling the stories of black women, but telling a wide range of stories. Um, and of course, Change from Silence is one of the books that really represents what this moment is. Um, how are you feeling about your book these days? Um, you know, I feel wonderful about the book, but I feel more, um, in many ways, vindicated for the women who are represented in that book. Mm -hmm. um, my goal was to tell, you know, their stories. And so um, the public reception mm -hmm. and the reception that the book has received within the academic community um, has been wonderful. It's been overwhelming mm -hmm. um, in many ways, and it's also been, um, empowering and a way of validating these yeah. women's um, struggles, um, their trials and their tri triumphs, and in many ways a way of um, honoring them posthumously, you know. I, the interviews I've heard you do about the book, um, what I've read of the book, I was there when you got the award from um, yeah. African American Women Historians. Um, it doesn't seem like this was just a research subject yeah. to you. It, it seemed, it feels like it's something much more deeply personal. Um, talk about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I definitely have personal connections, you know, to this work. Um, one of the things that inspired me most um, in the writing of the book was um, my great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. My great-grandmother um, was born to a family of sharecroppers in Jim Crow, Georgia. Um, she lived under the fog of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, she lived just five miles from the Troop County chain gang, mm -hmm. which was uh, one of the worst chain gangs or named the worst chain gang, you know, in the state of Georgia. And, um, you know, one of the things that I wrote about in the prologue to the book was um, the silences, you know, that she kept and how the book was in many ways an attempt to interpret her silences. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. that there was a lot of unspoken pain um, she was never um, incarcerated, but um, witnessing violence mm -hmm. oftentimes is just as bad as um, experiencing it. And so I remember her, um, one thing that I didn't talk about in the prologue, but I remember her sharing a story about when my great grandfather um, and she were, they were courting. Mm -hmm and um, they went to the picture show. <laughs> and some white guys um, came and essentially accosted my great-grandfather by taking a pillowcase of cats and dropping them on him. And the cats like scratched gotcha. him up because he was being you know, an uppity Negro right. for taking his woman out on the town. And you know, she was playing the lady. You know? right. um, so although, and my great-grandparents were born my great-grandmother was born in 1906. My great-grandfather was born in 1905. So, um, you know, they truly experienced Jim Crow and all of its um, 
brutality, you know, mm -hmm. and witnessing it, and, and my great grandfather, in his particular case, experiencing it, you know, physically and being, you know, a victim of, of racialized violence. Yeah. Um, and so, when my great grandfather decided that he was going to quit the South, he um, moved to Michigan. He during World War II, he took a job in a foundry. And um, it took him five years, but he relocated his wife and all of his children. They had a couple more children in Michigan. They had 13 children in total. So um, it took him about five years you know, to relocate 10 of those children. They had two more children. Um, so just understanding you know, what they went through um, and attempting to you know, honor their memory and legacy through the writing of this book. So I definitely have you know, a deep, um, a deep Georgia connection. Um, and I also have, you know, incarcerated family members. My god sister was incarcerated for four years in a penitentiary in Connecticut. And I just remember, um, you know, feeling like she had died. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that um, had to do with the fact that, you know, you have very limited communication. Although she lived in Michigan, they, she was incarcerated in Connecticut. Right. Um, and so, you know, she committed a federal crime, essentially. Um, well, they sent her to a federal prison. She and her um, husband at the time robbed a bank. And they couldn't get jobs, you know, they had just had another child and, you know, they were struggling and this, he had been in and out of the penitentiary. Well. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. so for them, you know, they went into a key bank and, and they robbed the bank. But, you know, they had other histories of you know, larceny and drug trafficking and other things that they had done um, as a means of survival and it doesn't necessarily make it right, but they had experienced so much exclusion. Um, they couldn't get jobs, you know. He had a record, so he couldn't get a job. Um, they had limitations on where they could live. They were having difficulty getting public assistance right. um, because oftentimes you can't get, you know, public assistance if you um, have been convicted of a felony. So just understanding, you know, her experiences too um, and spending time talking to her about what that was like, you know, being on the inside um, also helped to inspire me to um, tell these stories. You know, it's interesting. The irony of your point, of course, is um, you tell a story of folks, not only when we're talking about convicted, but folks who are forced to labor, right? Yes. These, these are convicts who are also leased right. to work, right? And so the irony of, of having a population of black bodies they can't actually fly and find jobs, That's but right. then they become uh, incarcerated and then they're compelled to work That's right. for the state in this way. That's right. Yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting about your narrative, when folks think about chain gangs, for instance, yeah. right? and, and I can just see or hear Sam Cooke singing chain yeah. gang, right? And we often think about this as almost kind of a proving ground for black masculinity. Yeah. Um, and you blow that open for us, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't think we ever think about right. the fact that black women were on chain gangs, right? Yeah. You know, it makes me think of some of the conversations we've had in the past about plantation life. Yeah. And this kind of false reading of history, which all the black women were in the house and, and mm -hmm. all the men were working in the fields. That's as if right. women weren't working on fields, very often pregnant, very often with their children. Um, you kind of open that up for a different kind of take mm -hmm. of what was happening. Um, was there, were there things you came across that surprised you oh in that gosh. regard? Like stories you heard that you, that you, that just gave you reason to pause? Yeah. I remember, I'll never forget it, um, when I was in graduate school, the first time I was introduced to Maddie Crawford, mm -hmm. who opens up um, the book. And I was looking through microfilm, and I wasn't looking for that article um, in the Atlanta Constitution. I was just looking for, you know, other Something else. I can't even remember now what I was looking for because finding her um, or sh her finding me um, was just so compelling in that right. moment. Um, Maddie Crawford was uh, a female blacksmith. Um, she was actually initially arrested um, and um, convicted of killing her stepfather, who she claimed abused her. And so because she was um, tall, um, and she was, you know, brawny. They decided to send her to the Chattahoochee Brickyard to mine clay. And while she was there, you know, she's making bricks, she's mining clay. But then they decide to, uh, to teach her um, the blacksmith trade. Right. But what the article says um, 
in addition to that, that she wasn't necessarily just an apprentice, they beat her out of her skirts into men's garments, right? right? And so there was this whole pragmatic thing too. They wanted her, you know, to, to do this to do this labor. Right. So she, here, she, this woman is she's working like a man. She's right. dressed like a man, um, and that was just so, just unbelievable to me, yeah. you know, yeah. in a time period where you have these sort of binary constructions of right. black women's very labor. Clear. Right. Very, very clear, clear lines. Right. Either you are working in the fields or you're working in the house or you may not be working, you no, know, at no, all, but no. you're working to serve your family, right? right? right. right. So right. either you're right. a domestic worker in a white household, you're serving your family or you're working in the field. Right. And those are the only narratives that I really right. understood yeah. about yep. black women's work in the post-emancipation context. So to come across this woman blacksmith um, was just amazing you know it was, it was an amazing discovery and to see how much wealth the state extracted you know from this woman um, she left the Chattahoochee Brickyard in um, 1900 when the state prison farm was established and so what they do is they take her send her to the state prison farm and then they begin to hire her out throughout the city of Milledgeville, where the state prison farm was, to work for um, you know, private individuals. So she's doing all of this blacksmithing work, and she's generating all of this fame, which is how right. she ends up in the Atlanta Constitution but not newspaper. For but she's not getting any income for herself. But what she does gain is a sense of mobility. Yeah. She's able yeah. to, you know, um, leave the premises of, you know, that prison plantation to, I guess, for lack of a better word, sort of um, pretend to be free. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, there's this sort of fleeting freedom that she, that she gets and this sense of social capital that she yeah. also gets within that prison plantation community because she, she's known as a trustee. Yeah. So she's within that prison community privileged. Yeah. Um, relatively speaking. Do you feel as though your book has shed any more light on even the presence of black women, incarcerated black women today? Yeah. Because um, I think there's still a gap around our sense of, again, when oh, yeah. we talk about the criminal justice system, um, there's a way in which I think your narrative, and, and Ava did such fantastic work with the 13th, but there's a way in which yeah. your work and the work of others is gendering our right. sense of what the 13th right. is, right? Even shedding light on what that experience is for black women now. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that um, black women are still over-policed and over-incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I would argue is that um, this is not the past. The past is the present. present. And, you know, in this context, you have, um, in post-Civil War Georgia, almost 100% of the female prison population was comprised of black women. <laughs> so when we think about the crisis in black female mass incarceration today, right, it's natural. Right, right. It's natural. It's, it's essentially the natural state or condition, <laughs> you know, of black women. Black women have always been over-incarcerated, um, particularly in spaces where black people um, make up a significant portion of the population. So that could be in urban, you know, spaces in this context, in the post-emancipation South, not until, you know, the Great Migration do you see black people moving out of the South in droves, but over 90% of the black population was still right. in the South, you know, for decades after the Civil War. So it would make sense that majority of the black women in the country were incarcerated right. in this space, and black women are still over-incarcerated. Well, we're talking about this, about this moment before we actually come to terms with over-incarceration, the ways in which being black and female, particularly black, yeah. female, and poor is criminalized. Yes, being black, female, poor, um, jobless, all of that is criminalized. So in this context, you would be known as a vagrant, and yeah. you would be arrested and, you know, fined yeah. And given a yeah. fine that you can't pay, and then you end up working off your fine on a chain gang, yeah. right? So today, you know, when people can't pay their bail, right. they sit and they rot, you know, for years at a time right. until they like, can get a for hearing. Things like for tickets. things like parking tickets, right. um, for things like, you know, stealing a few bras from Macy's because you may not have the income to be right. able to, to purchase. Right. And if you got to go on that job interview, yeah. you need... There you go. Or right. you need clothing for a job interview or whatever right. the case, right. you know, may be. So um, 
the structures or you know structural racism and all of the variables that precipitated the mass incarceration of black women in the past is very well alive today you know racism um, you know poverty um, exclusion uh, violence you know yeah. against black women there are a whole lot of things that um, precipitate the the the, ma the mass incarceration epidemic that we see with black women today I'm gonna throw two names out for you Nell Painter mm -hmm. and Darlene Clark Hine. Um, and, and there's a way that the argument can be made that the two of them, together and independently, almost willed black women's history mm -hmm. <laughs> into a field. Mm -hmm. um, what does that feel like now from your vantage? Um, when I think about the folks who are at a UVA, the, the folks who are at Penn, um, my good friends Martha Jones and, and Jessica mm -hmm. Marie Johnson at Hopkins. Um, it, you know, if there's, is there, if there's a hot commodity, it seems. <laughs> In the academy now, it, it's black women historians. Um, how, in what ways do you feel validated because yeah. of that now? I mean, you know, you're validating a particular narrative, but yeah. you're also, your presence in the academy telling the stories that you're telling is also a validation. Yeah. I mean, it's a tremendous honor. You know, these are the women who, it feels like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, mm. right? Um, nothing could have prepared me for the level of praise and success and the accolades and all of what has come as a result of um, this work. And again, this work was not about me. Right. And so, right. In honoring, you know, Dr. Hine, and honoring um, Dr. Painter, this work came as a result of the struggles that they had early on, you know, attempting to get African American women's history recognized and validated as its own discipline. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in many ways, this work pays homage to these women and to all of the black women mm -hmm. scholars who have helped pave the field. You know, um, there was a wonderful conference put on by um, Professor Dinah Ramey Berry, another powerful mm -hmm. black woman um, historian, and Professor Pearl Dagbovi at mm -hmm. Michigan State. And it was a cross-generational dialogues in black women's right. history conference. Right. And to have the opportunity to honor women like you know, um, Sharon Harley, um, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, right. um, you know, Wilma King, of course, Professor Hine, right. um, to honor Professor Painter, to honor, you know, all of these women who have done such dynamic things for our field. Th that, that you remember reading in the stacks. Yeah, that I remember <laughs> reading in the stacks and, you know, who I still fangirl right. over, right. you know? So, it's um, it's just a tremendous honor. I mean, I don't I don't know any other way to say it. I just feel extremely blessed. I feel um, not only validated, but I feel challenged. Yeah. You know, um, they make me want to be a better scholar. Um, I admire them and I respect them so much. And so to be able to um, to do a work and to do a job well done, right? It's just so. Um, I feel honored and, and humbled and just very grateful that I can make these women proud. What's next in the archive for you? Oh, yeah. So um, I've got a couple of, of um, irons in the fire. Right now, I'm actually um, working on a, a medical history mm. of um, the postbellum, you know, penal medical economy that emerged around um, some of the bodies in this right. book, some and, of those. And, and experimentation on Yeah, and experimentation on those bodies. And um, looking at the exploitation of these women who were seemingly disposable bodies mm -hmm. or broken bodies or sick bodies, you know, um, and the ways that the state continued to extract mm -hmm. um, wealth that, yeah. from those bodies wow. and how those bodies continued to have a fiduciary value even when they were um, seemingly broken or right. disposable, but they never were disposable because right. they found a way to repurpose um, their bodies and just the laboring that sick people do right. that is not accounted for. And, and that's an interesting story because, you know, we all think about Gila, the, right. the Gila cell, and, and, you know, that's not that's until right. the mid-20th mid century. 
you know, it suggested it was very natural for what that's went right. down then because they had already been they doing already this kind it. of work. I mean, that's what we know about the mm -hmm. hot and hot Venus, right, in, yeah. in that context, yeah. Yeah, so much of that applies you yeah. know, in this context, so stay tuned. <laughs> we have been joined today by professor, historian, Talitha LaFloria, who is associate professor of African American Studies at the Carter G. Woodson Institute at the University of Virginia. She is the author of the award-winning Chained in Silence, Black Women in Convict Labor in the New South, published by our friends down the road, the University <laughs> of North Carolina Press. Thank you for joining us, Talitha. Thank you so much. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We 